All right, so welcome to the uh, Global non competitive Geometry Seminar. So it's uh, Jimin Wang, Texas University, but early in the morning, but we're happy that he can give this talk on an index theoretical proof of Romo's cube inequality. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. And I should say good afternoon or good morning or good evening or to, to whoever out of the world. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's very nice to give the talk here. And today my topic is an index rather proof of gross from of cube inequality. So this is a drawn work with Zhu Zhangxi and Gu Yu. So here, the what I'm basically going to talk about is a cube inequality. It's a geometric inequality of manifold with positive scalar curvature. So uh, before I talk about what is the inequality, let's uh, review a little bit on what is uh, scalar curvature or curvature things. So here um, is some basic definition of Riemannian geometry. So uh, we have the Lebesivita connection, and then the uh, curvature tensor, and then we have this component, which is a four tensor. And if we take trees on the first and the second component, we'll get the Ricci. And if we take again the trees of the Ricci, we will get the scalar curvature. Well, <laughs> that's how geometry just do, but yeah, that's the case. So, so curvature is basically a tensor, but when you move everything down to the scalar curvature, you will get only a number. This can be the weakest curvature of a Riemannian manifold. But equivalent, I prefer the following definition. The scalar curvature measures the volume of a geodesic ball in the Riemannian manifold, uh, given by the following formula. So left hand side is the volume of the ball over the volume of the standard ball in Rn, which I don't want to write down the formula, it involves some gamma functions, okay. But the right hand side is the Taylor expansion of this uh, volume with respect to R. It has one at the first R, at the zero order term, and R square here appears the scalar curvature and high order term. Okay. In particular, for surface, the scalar curvature is two times uh, Gaussian curvature. And I think everyone knows well about Gaussian curvature. It's an intrinsic, intrinsic uh, thing, and it's uh, followed by the Gaussian's. Remarkable theorem. Okay, so from the definition, from this formula, we can see uh, well, sphere has its uh, positive curvature or positive scalar curvature. In fact, for ge in general, the SN, n dimensional sphere is also a thing of positive scalar curvature, and its scalar curvature is equal to n times n minus one, the unit sphere, which is a constant. So, uh, from the perspective of uh, geometry that we know, at least for surfaces, positive curvature will give us something boundedness, but negative curvature will, will lead us to unboundedness or infinite thing. So uh, this is actually a theorem, a classical theorem, differential geometry. So um, the Bernoulli theorem. If we have a surface with positive Gaussian curvature uh, from below, and then it's bounded, it's a finite diameter. And this theorem can be generalized to higher dimension by replacing the Gaussian curvature by rich curvature. Or I, I think you can still use sectional curvature to get the same result. So here I'll just write Ricci. If Ricci is bounded below by some uh, positive constant, then its diameter is finite. That means this is complete Riemannian manifold is a compact Riemannian manifold, no infinite things. Okay. A natural question to ask that if we have a similar result for scalar curvature, but uh, what is the best thing with that also is no. So let's look at a few examples. So in the first case, if we have a manifold with no matter what kind of scalar curvature it is, uh, let's assume the scalar is bounded below by some negative number. Okay. Then if we multiply this thing by a sphere, then that will produce a positive scalar curvature metric everywhere. For example, the flat Rn is flat in any sense. But if we multiply it with the S2, then they will end up with a manifold with positive scalar curvature. And in general, we can make the sphere as small as, small as possible to kill every negative thing on the original manifold. So th that would be an infinite thing with positive scalar curvature everywhere, uniformly even. So um, we have to have some uh, topolo topological restriction on that manifold. For example, it does not contain a sphere. So that's why when we talk about this kind of theorem, we really use the word uh, spherical. Basically, this word means 
no sphere. Okay. But even for a spherical manifold, for example, the, the, I think the simplest spherical manifold is RM. We can still find a uh, complete uh, matrix there with uniform particles character if n is greater or equal to three. And following is a construction. Uh, let's assume that R3 is uh, some kind of tube, and at one end, we will attach a S3. So for this S3 thing, just as, what, as we computed above, uh, we will have the scalar curvature is about n times n minus two, so it was six. And the real thing, we give a flat matrix of R multiplied with S2, so the scalar curvature is at least two. And near the equator, when the two things are put together, we can, well, smooth it a little bit. Uh, I think you, we believe that we can do it, okay? And this will end up with a, pot, with, with a positive scalar curvature, at least positive than one, okay? So, but the value is still R3, nothing else. The topology is quite trivial, but the, the metric we, we see is the, the scalar curvature is positive everywhere. And definitely this metaphor is M bounded, okay? So, uh, there will be subtlety to talk about the problem. Whenever we have a positive scalar curvature metric, or even uniformly positive, we cannot control its size. We can still count infinite things. Okay. And uh, here comes the QB inequality. Okay. Let's uh, consider a Q. We have a standard Q. That would be the nth product of interval. And we give an arbitrary metric rather than the, the flat one. And let's assume that the metric is at least n times n minus one. So here is just, just a, 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 a convention that will make the curvature and then upper bound to be this. In general, we can rescale the metric a little bit to get a well, arbitrary number. Here we, we use n times n minus one just because it, it can be seen as for example, part of the sphere. Then uh, if we denote by Li, to be the distance of the i's opposite pair of the boundary of the cube, then we will have the inequality. One over L1 squared plus one over L2 squared plus dot, 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 plus one over L1 squared is greater than n squared over four pi squared. So consequently, we will have the minimum of the distance uh, is at least two pi over square root of n. At least one of them is that's on this guy. So for example, here, here's a picture of two dimensional cube. We have the L1 and L2 that represent the distance of the optic edges. And then we know that one over L1 squared plus one over L2 squared has to be greater than well, S2, so it's one over pi squared. So uh, this kind of inequality uh, showed that positive curvature can still somehow control the size or the scale of a uh, cube. But it can still be, be large because, for example, you look at the picture like this, the star shift. Okay. And um, you can see it, it's still a very large, can be a very large star, but it doesn't violate the cube inequality because the distance of, for example, the two edges it's still small, okay? So um, we can still look back our picture previously, uh, for example, here. If we have a cube, cut it off here. I'm oh, sorry, I cannot draw a three-dimensional picture, but you can imagine it is true. That would be a three-dimensional cube, okay? And uh, uh, although the cube can be very, very large, but when we measure the distance of opposite faces, for example, here, we only measure it from the S2 direction. So it's still small. Okay, so far, any questions for the statement of the inequality? Okay, nice. And uh, we have a number N squared over four pi squared on the right hand of the inequality. So uh, actually this number is optimal, yeah. If we reduce the number to even a very small epsilon, and they will get counting examples. Here's the following pro uh, proposition that states about the optimality. For any epsilon, epsilon greater than zero, if we uh, 
replace the number on the right hand side with the number original minus epsilon, then we can find a metric on the cube where square curvature is n times n minus one. So the construction is very specifically. We uh, use a warped metric on the cube and we find a nice function given by this cosine thing. Well, it, but it seems a little bit abstract because then you have to like sit down and do the computation and find the square curvature. You find that it's exactly as I said, and then compute the, the, the metric, the, the distance. Uh, let, let's look at a very simple example. So um, think about a part of the sphere, okay? And this is part of a sphere. And we, we remove a small disk uh, near the two poles. Okay, and uh, for the metric on this part of the sphere, uh, we'll give it almost the standard metric on the cube. Oh, sorry, on the, on, on the sphere. That's, I mean, more, almost by on the, this direction, uh, this will be the latitude direction, it will be the original metric. As for the longitude direction, uh, it will be the, uh, the original metric times a very, very, very large number. Okay. And you can think about if you're working on this sphere, uh, if you walk vertically, then this is the same thing as you walk on your sphere. But if you walk horizontally, we have a hard time. Okay. So let's find the distance. Okay. Uh, the distance of these two edges, well, that's the same of the your sphere, which gives us actually pi or almost pi because we have moved the two disks. And for the other side, uh, because we have uh, enlarged the metric to be a very, very large, so it's almost infinite. Okay, and if we take one over square and one over the other square, then we'll get almost uh, zero plus one over pi square, which is four over four pi square because four is two squared. Yeah, and then that, that's the case. Oh, by the way, um, for this metric, by the, by the construction, you can sit down the compute is Gaussian curvature, which is exactly two, I mean, n times n minus one. So here's the construction. Uh, for n-dimensional, we use this, actually the warped metric, but actually it's, it's quite simple to, to, to visualize the, the metric, at least on a sphere. Okay, and... Uh, here are some series of the, the, the inequality. So as originally stated by Gromov, it proved the, the, this inequality using the minimal surface method. And you know, this may have some dimension restriction. For example, n is less than or equal to eight. And when, it's, when n is less greater or equal to nine, and his proof relies on the results of Shun Yao in 2017. So, so I am not an expert in differential geometry, so I, I don't want to give any comment on this result. Okay, um, so that's it. And uh, uh, another uh, proof of the theorem is by Xu in 2020 uh, with the suboptimal optimal concept. Here I mean suboptimal is the, what happens on the right-hand side is not n square or four pi square, but maybe a, a, a smaller number. Uh, that, that means you still have some kind of inequality and uh, some control of the scale, but not the optimal one. And this is uh, this proof uh, using a, use a quantitative method. And uh, when m is one, well, uh, you may say uh, it, 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 it makes no sense to talk about m is one. It's just a line. Line has no curvature, but we can still talk about it by, for example, multiplied by um, manifold, another manifold. For example, multiplied by a torus or in general, uh, a compact manifold with non-zero higher index. In this case, we will call your layout the bandwidth inequality. It is proved by Zeller in 2020 with the optimal constant. And by Guo and Xi and Yu in uh, 2020, but with a suboptimal constant. Okay. So uh, let me make a remark on what is suboptimal. Actually, the, the, the spirit of the two proofs are quite similar use a so-called quantitative key theory method. And um, I believe that this kind of method cannot obtain the, the general constant, the, the, the really optimal constant. 
but we can still do as best as we can. Um, in fact, in the proof, in this kind of proof, it requires some specific choice of function, and which is, uh, I think, in, 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 in months ago, uh, you know, very a nice talk maybe given in this seminar by Alan about Riemann hypothesis to mention some function given by Slapian. So that Slapian's kind of function gives almost the, the, the almost the best uh, function that can be done to get some uh, constant here. But this is not the, exactly the best, but uh, there's still a flexibility. We can do a little bit, move a little bit further, but no matter what, uh, it's still distance from the best constant. Okay. So far, any questions? All right. And uh, now let me talk a little bit about the proof, particularly for, for one dimensional, because it's a simplest case. Oh, by the way, um, I have to first mention the, the, what I mean by product. Okay, uh, we start from a cube, but we multiply it by another manifold um, that has spin, that is spin and has non-zero higher index in the cube group of the group six algebra. Then we can still talk about the, the, the cube inequality. Okay, that is uh, the, the distance of the opposite faces in the product uh, and it takes uh, one over Li square and sum up as to have a lower bound. Okay, and this uh, expression describes what I mean here by M is one. Okay, in the product theorem say here, when M is one, this is exactly the bandwidth inequality. Okay, now let's talk about it a bit. So uh, let's first look at M is one. Uh, we start from the band, well, m cross uh, interval with scalar curvature greater than equal to n times m minus one. And uh, we know by l the distance. There's only one distance, so there's no need to take the uh, summation or whatever. So uh, this is a, a, a only a part of the manifold. It's a manifold with boundary and even with corners. So um, I, I think what we prefer is to consider complete manifold so we extend the metric from the interval or from the band to the whole real line. You can think about it as a tube, okay? And we assume that uh, away from a compact set or at infinity, the metric on the tube is a product metric, product of a standard metric on M and the standard metric on R. So on this product metric or the product manifold, also, I mean the M cross R, we can talk about its index theory. So, but it's non-compact, so uh, a direct operator may not be flat home. But there are still uh, plenty of ways to talk about its index. I think uh, one basic way is to use so-called relative index theorem. I think originally uh, raised by Gromov to talk about uh, index theory on non-compact manifolds. Or more general case, you can think about like, for example, Rolf's algebra. But here we use another way um, to add a potential and get a so-called Kalias type operator, which is given by something D or something else. So well, we, I think we understand this well for at least for real line. If we have the direct operator in the real line and we add a potential given by uh, simply the X, multiplication by X, the, the quantity function, then they will get a thread home operator. This operator is, is really thread home. And we can compute its index, which coincide the pairing of the direct operator and the bot element of the real line. And here, we also use the bot element of R and gives us a, this um, Kalias type operator, D plus Z times E. Here, Z, I mean, the, the coordinate function And E is a Clifford modification. Okay. And after we have done this pairing, we'll obtain a Fred home operator and its index lies in the, the, the higher, uh, the, the case theory of the group six algebra, which is equal to higher index of M, which is non zero. But here we know Fred home index is invariant under homotopy. So uh, we can actually 
uh, deform the potential a little bit to get a better one. It, it's, it's used to be the quiet function, but we can use another like potential psi to compute the same index. Sorry, can I can I ask a, a short question? Yes, D, yes, please. Yeah, uh, D is only on M or or uh, on D, M D is a, the direct operator on the whole 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 space M cross R on the cylinder. Okay, thanks. On the cylinder, yes. Yep, that's question. Thank you. Okay, I uh, here I should mention yeah D is a direct operator. Okay, okay, um, and we're gonna deform the the original potential quantity function by another potential psi. And we compute a square uh, because we know the Clifford multiplication anti commutes with D. So a square will give us the first term we know well from the Lichnowitz formula that would be scalar curvature. And the psi square comes from the square of psi times E. And then the, uh, the, the commutator will give us a uh, lower bound by the gradient of psi. Okay. And we prove the M is one case by contradiction. If our L is large enough, then we, we are able to choose a nice psi so that the right hand side, everything, is strictly positive. And, and then that will lead to a contradiction because its index should be non zero. Okay. But we know the positive thing has index zero. All right. Let's look back at the formula here. We can find a psi so that the right hand side is positive. And uh, we can think about two parts of the cylinder. Inside the band, so here I draw a picture of the cylinder, and here we have the band. Okay. So inside the band, the scalar curvature is positive. So that will give us a dominant term that shows that this, this guy is positive. Okay. But uh, when the scalar curvature is positive, the psi can still move under the control of scalar curvature. You can think about that uh, the and the protection of the scalar curvature, a positive one, the psi can accumulate his power. Okay, but if we give this psi guy enough time for him to accumulate his power, then outside the band, we may have a very, very, large, very large psi. Then psi will be our dominant term that will give us a whole thing that bonded from below. Oh, by the way, so because we have assumed that the, the metric is product outside the compact set, so the scalar curvature on the whole cylinder at least is bonded below by some minus negative number. So if we can lift this psi to be a large enough number, then we're done. Okay, here let me talk a little bit about how to construct this psi. Okay, I, I, I put the formula here again. Uh, we said psi is a function f composed with a function z of x. So x is a part of the side, okay? And here z, we define it by um, psi of x times the distance minus l two. Let me draw a picture of okay? Here's a band, and this is m times zero. Okay, and we have a point, then we'll compute its distance from the left hand side of the band, and then we'll multiply a sign. Here, sign just means if it's the right, then we'll give a positive, and the left, then we'll give a negative. So, this is a, what does a sign mean? Okay, and then we minus l over two to get it almost zero here, and on this side, is minus L over two. And on, at this side, it's almost L over two. Well, at least at some point, because we know the distance is L. Okay. And the property of Z is that it, it, it actually uh, uh, serves as a, the coordinate function. Okay. It, because it's one Lipschitz and it certified that if our point lies, uh, sorry, our Z value is smaller than or equal to L over two, then our point has to be inside the band. And at infinity, this zs coincide with the euro coordinate function. Here I mean coincide by at least up to some constant or up to some scalar modification, but uh, up to some plus some constant, but okay, doesn't matter. 
Okay, and here's our coordinate. You can you can think about this z is a, a coordinate function on this remaining band. We have uh, encode the encode the metric information here. All right. If we uh, replace side by this guy, then we can look back at the formula. Here, the first term will be the same scalar of four times n minus n n minus one, and plus here psi square is simply f square, and the minus gradient. Well, we use the chain rules. Well, you, you have learned from high school, yeah, or or university. It will be f prime. Okay, let's assume f a prime is always positive. Is uh, that mean f is uh, some increasing function? Okay. And that would be our function on the right hand side because the z function is one limit. Okay, uh, so for any questions? All right, now we have talked about this z, but then our f. So let's, uh, we have uh, put again the formula here. And in particular, inside the band, because scalar curvature at, at least n times n minus one, so we will get a formula like this n squared over four plus f squared minus f prime. Well, uh, now we get an, an, an ODE. If we want this number to be positive, or maybe we can think about it to be zero, then we can solve this ODE and get a function f, which is a tangent. Here, tangent nx over two is exactly the function that solved the ODE. So think about our f is a function like this, okay? It starts from zero in the middle, and uh, when x or, or the, I mean, the, the variable goes larger and larger, then we'll get a tangent, okay? But uh, we know that tangent will blow up, right? When, I mean, for example, x is, I mean, what's inside is power two, so x is, um, uh, sorry, pi over n, then the tangent will blow up. Okay, so uh, if our our band is longer than uh, this number, I mean, at least L over two is greater than pi over n, if, then we will have enough space for this tangent to blow up. We can lift the F to be even infinite. Well, uh, actually, we do not have to make it infinite. It, it's large. It's fine if it's large enough. Then we can cut it off and to to make it a horizontal function. Oh, all right. The, the, you have to pay careful attention for this part to no smoothing it. But I believe that this can be done. Okay. But no matter, no matter what, if we have the l over two greater than pi over n, then this tangent function can blow up inside. So we have enough time to lift our f or our psi even to infinite, okay? So, uh, so you know, infinite can beat everything. And uh, as a conclusion, this will finish the proof. Inside the band, uh, because we have a positive curvature and we give this F almost tangent function and it can go larger and larger, even to infinite if we, the band is not long enough. The outside band because it's infinite, then it controls everything. Gives us a positive. Okay, you can see this tangent function really plays an important role in the proof. Okay, um, we can think about the the construction of the 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 concrete example I mentioned before for the optim optimality, and there there we require a function like cosine to some power, but it still comes from tangent. And I think even in the original proof of Gromov using minimal method, minimal surface method, and can still use some, some kind of function of tangent, like in the mu bubble or something. Else. I don't know that well, but yeah. So it's still in the similar spirit. So um, yeah. Okay. Um, so for any questions? All right. Uh, here's everything for MS1. But what about uh, MS larger? Well, um, if we uh, think about the higher dimension, we can still consider the Kalias type operator here, like this. Here, e from E1 to En is just uh, the N uh, 
clifford multiplication of the n uh, linear independent vectors. And the f1 to fn is still somehow like tangent function, okay? And z1 to zn are the coordinate functions. Well, uh, if we can like think about, well, we know how to construct a tangent. If we know how to construct a coordinate functions, then we're done. Because the index of this guy is that the pair of pairing of the, the drug operator with the both element on Rn, we will get a non-zero index and blah, 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 the, the computation. Okay, it, it seems a quite simple thing, but there's still thought of it. The thought is not, not come from the tangent, actually the coin the functions. The question is, does there always exist such kind of quantity functions? So here I will give the definition, okay. we we'll start from the metric on the cube. We have to extend it to Rn. And we call it a good extension if first we assume that the metric is Euclidean outside compact set. Okay, so, so we can talk about the ball element. And then the functions from Z1 to Zn has to be one Lipschitz so that we can uh, replace the gradient by a prime. And furthermore, it satisfies uh, for any i the if the zi all of the zi is less than or equal to li over two then the point should be lies inside the cube so why do we need this because you can think about the converse way um if the point is outside the cube the one of the zi has to be greater or equal to have to have to be greater than li over two so think about the picture. We can have the, uh, uh, the, the positivity if one of them is infinite, okay? If one of the function is greater than L over two, then this F will be infinite. And that's enough for our proof, right? And then we, if we remove our, uh, sorry, if, I, if we reverse our uh, statement, then we'll get this, okay? And the last requirement that the, the, all the functions should coincide with the coordinate function at infinity. Here I mean coincide by, um, it can be a scalar multiplication, can be a, a plus and constant, but whatever, it has to be almost the same. Okay. Uh, so far, any questions? For the definition of what I mean by good extension. Okay, so uh, if we are able to find a good extension, then everything's done, okay? But here's the problem. So uh, is it always possible? Well, uh, for one dimensional case, uh, actually you can say no problem arises for this because any extension is good. The construction is quite simple. You just, yeah, I think write a construction before use a sine function and then you're done. But for a uh, higher dimension, well, for example, at least two, there are ex bad extensions. Well, uh, let me give you an example, okay. Let's think about a, a very uh, simple cube that lies inside a sphere, okay? But how do we extend the metric to R2? If we are unlucky, we may get a metric like this. Well, you can think about that it should be a Euro R2 attached with a bubble on the top. And, and on the top of the bubble, you have our cube there. Okay. I claim that this extension is bad. We can never find this Z1, Z2. If we do, then the pair, the coordinate function pair, Z1, comma, Z2, will give us a map from the this space to the Euro uh, R2. Okay, and our restriction is that, uh, let me move back a little bit. If uh, for any point, the i is less than equal to, sorry, l over two, then the point is lies in the cube. So that means the inverse image of the, let me draw the picture. The inverse image of the cube with 
uh, boundaries with boundaries like L over two or something, the, the inverse image should contain the cube. Okay, this is what I mean by the, the, the what I mean by the second uh, restriction. Okay. Now let's think about uh, a line to infinity. What happened at infinity? Because at infinity, the, the V1, Z2 coincide with the quantity function. So let's draw a very, very large circle. And that would be mapped to a standard circle here. Okay. And which has Y number one around this disk. But you know, y number is, is stable. If we shrink the circle inside, uh, maybe here to this narrow neck, it will still have y number one, always. But since the, the, the neck is far away from the cube, the image of that, that neck, let me actually use a different color. Uh, How do I change color? Okay, uh, I will color this neck by green, and uh, its image is something here. It should not touch the, this small cube because if it touch that inverse image, we know that it lies in the original cube, but it's still far away. So, the, okay, yeah. But here, uh, it leads to a contradiction because um, we still have another restriction that one lifts. The neck is very, very narrow, you know, the distance is very, very small. So its image should also be small. So I cannot move or go around the, this large cube for, for one round with, with the one number one. Then that, that will give a contradiction, okay. So uh, yeah, if we start from the cube at the top, then actually we will end up uh, if we extend the metric like this, then we'll end up a bad metric. Okay. All right. Uh, so final question for the example. Okay. Um, well, it seems no way to prove to, 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 to prove for on this space, you know, we cannot even find the function D1, Z2. So it's impossible, but we are talking about the cube. So we, although there can be bad extensions, but uh, can we just choose one? Because what happens outside the, 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 the what well, outside cube does not matter to us. So uh, the key point of the higher dimensional case is that uh, we can choose a good extension. If we don't, then everything's done. So here's a, uh, here's what follows that for any n and any remaining metric on the cube, uh, we can have a good extension. Well, it doesn't matter, matter which we choose, but if we get one, then it's done. So let me briefly talk about how to construct this good extension. If we have a cube here, okay, let's, talk, let's think about two dimensional, okay. Um, we don't extend the metric directly to the whole plane, but we first look at the cross. Okay. And at the cross, we can extend the metric and uh, we assume that the metric is very, 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 very large on the arms. So that the, the, the distance of the two edges of the arm is very, very large. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, also for the same here. So when we think about the distance of the upper edge of the arm and the lower edge, I mean the, okay, I'll draw the orange line and the, for example, the, 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 the red line here, So uh, we want to ensure that the distance of the two lines is greater or equal to our L1, if we have L1 originally here. All right, 
we can do this by enlarge the metric at least horizontally on the arms uh, away from the cube. Uh, yeah, we make it very, very large. And similarly for the other arm. Okay, uh, maybe you can see here I draw a standard cube, but what, what if our cube looks like this? Okay, because the distance you see is getting, getting, it's getting smaller. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's possible. And if we extend it, well, maybe it gets smaller distance like this. So, but we, we, we can tolerate some error, you know. Although greater, maybe not greater or equal to L1, we can at least ensure that greater or equal to L1 minus some epsilon with epsilon small enough. So if we walk one step away from the cube, it can be a little bit smaller, but we have to make it large ASAP, okay? So eventually uh, we will still get some, like, something like that, okay? Now uh, we start from a cube to a cross that the cross satisfies here, this kind of condition. Each edge of the arm has distance greater than this thing. And then we extend the metric from the cross to the top plane. Well, this can always be done. We can choose the arbitrary extension. We can see uh, in this case, because our choice on the first tab, we have avoided what happens on the last page, uh, uh, the, the bubble case. Because in that case, the arm somehow is very narrow and very small, but that this cannot happen here. Okay. So, uh, this is our choice of the extension. So let's look at this picture. Well, um, here's our cross, okay? Topologically, it's still a cross, but metrically, the cross looks like this, okay? It has very fat arms. And um, we have a blue line and a red line. So we define, for example, our Z1 of X to be the uh, sine of X times the distance of X with the red line. As I just draw it here, then minus L1 over two. Here, this sign just means if X is above the red line, then it's positive and below the L line, Red line is negative. Well, this can be done, okay. Oh, by the way, I, I, I didn't mention that on, on the, but have to, I have to mention that on the cross, we assume that at infinity, the metric is almost Euclidean or exactly Euclidean, but it, it can be the, it has to be the Euclidean multiply a very, very, very large number. Okay, and similarly for the D2, it should be the, uh, So Z2 of X is actually the sine of X. Maybe I should write another notation like sine two times the distance of X with a blue line minus L2 over two. Here the sine means if on the right, then we make it positive. If on the left, we'll make it negative. Back. And because it's this Z1 and Z2 are made by distance, so it's one lip chips. And we can verify that it satisfies this um, condition that uh, if a point has C1, D2 both less than or equal to L1 or 2 and L2, then the point lies in the cube. This is ensured by our previous assumption that the two arms are far away from each other. Okay, so uh, since we got the good extension, nice coordinate functions, then we're done. Yeah, just compose this function with a tangent we have obtained. Uh, let me mention a little bit about higher dimension. So uh, for, for example, in three dimension, we have a cube. Well, that, that's uh, really a cube. And we, we, can, we, we have to do it inductively, okay? So first we need to extend things, okay, to the, uh, axis, quantity axis. 
and then we extend from the coin axis to the coin planes, and then to the whole space. Well, you can imagine, imagine at each step we assume our extension is large, the metric is large outside of the cube. So, uh, and thus we'll get a, a, a metric on the whole space, then that's what we want. Okay, and uh, I think here's everything. And um, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, question or comments? Questions, yeah. What is the use of, uh, of these inequalities? I mean, uh, uh, of course, if uh, Gromov says uh, they're interesting, uh, they must be interesting, but somehow, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you use them? I mean, it, it's unclear to me. Well, um, I, I have recently talked about with some, something with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, someone who, who are uh, doing differential geometry and said, he, he have used our inequality to prove another, uh, like I don't remember clearly, but it's some volume control of mm. uh, of the remaining manifold with particle scale curvature. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what, what it is exactly, but uh, yeah, it's useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I uh, ask a question? Um, this sounds very interesting. You said at the start that. Um, the case of just the cube, uh, where you go to the, the cube times a uh, compact manifold, it's not a, not a huge generalization. Uh, wh why is it not very much different? Uh, sorry, sorry please, say again, please. When you talked about the bandwidth uh, results of the MS1 case, then you take the interval times a manifold. And sorry, if, sorry I, I take the interval and say uh, again. And the Cartesian product of the manifold. Yeah. And I think if I, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but maybe uh, your result was just about the cube, right? Just this, the interval to the power n. Oh, yeah. Maybe I, I can jump to the, uh, the, the product uh, theorem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here. Yeah, here, exactly. And you, is it correct that you said that this is a mild generalization of just the case of a cube where m is a point? Oh, oh well, yes, I think so. Okay. Okay, can yeah, you explain okay, why, why that's the easy step? Oh, sorry, say again? Could you explain why that step is easy to go to general n? Uh, you mean, well, well, actually, we can we can directly prove this case, this theorem using the same method, because if we start from the cube like this, uh, well, we can think about extend the metric from m times the cube to oh, okay. m times r m. So every, everything just and, and of course, we need things. a we need a good extension. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay so and we can... use the same method to prove it. All right, thanks. Right, thank you. Maybe I may make another comment about sure. the Paros question. Uh, actually, you know, in uh, uh, Lee, Lee Chow and uh, Gromov recently proved some very striking theorem about non existence of remaining oh. matrix uh, with positive scalar curvature on a spherical manifold in dimension four and five. So, without any condition on the fundamental group, because for us, you know, we need Novikov type of result to prove that, but they prove that this without any condition and the proof use some of estimate like this. Yes, yes. Thanks for uh, so I, I that's... Think the, I think the proof heavily re re relies on the cube inequality, but, but lower dimension case is not for them because they only uh, care about like dimension lower than five. But if there is a chance to generalize to higher then. It has, to, it has to require some kind of higher dimension of it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Right. Anything else? So if not, then uh, well, thanks again, Jimin. Thank you. And so we meet each other again uh, in about two weeks from now. Take care. See you then. Bye-bye. See you then. Bye.